Okay, does anybody have any questions before we start today? So, you've got some stuff due when on my Econ Labs? Sunday. 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 Alright, this is a attendance sheet that I have neglected to do. Um, so, column one, I want you guys to put your initial by your name. Your name should be here unless you add it late or something. If you're not here for some reason, why don't you just add your name at the bottom. But I think everybody should be on this list. So just put your initial, pass it around the whole room. All right. Um, so we talked about consumers last time and the law of demand. So law of demand, price goes down, quantity demanded goes up. up. Price things get cheaper, people buy more. Yep. Which is completely false unless we tack on all other things stay the same. So not allowing other factors that change. And so what we left off with last time was the demand shifters, which we need to continue on with. So the most notable thing that's not on this list is the price of the good is not something that shifts demand. Students tend to get shift happy, which is not good. Don't get shift happy, um, meaning you shift too much because it's so much fun to do. But uh, so the price is such an important variable in the decision of how much stuff you buy that we choose to measure it right here. That's why price is on the vertical axis, and it then determines the look of the demand curve which is the downward sloping line. So if prices are high, we don't buy much stuff. If prices get a little lower, we buy a little bit more. If prices get a little bit lower, we buy more, we buy more, we buy more. And then if we keep collecting data on prices, we start to have a collection of points that get so close together, it's indistinguishable between a line. I like to have you think about it being a collection of points rather than it being a line because then it reinforces the two-dimensional nature to the demand function, whereas it's a relationship between the price of the good and the quantities that you buy. So think about that line that we kind of uh, fairly quickly and sometimes carelessly uh, draw down as a collection of points. All right, that's our demand curve. And then the demand curve moves around when other things in life change that influence our purchases. So we started off our list with income. Income had two cases though. What were those cases? Normal goods and inferior goods. Normal meant what? Taylor, is that something in your lap there? Oh, that's your hangnail. That's totally fine. It looked like a, it looked like a, uh, a phone dive there. Okay. So normal good meant what? What's kind of normal case between income and the quantities of stuff that you want to buy? Income goes up. Demand goes up. Demand goes up. Shifts to the right. So that was an increase in income leads to a increase in demand. So my notation here is an up arrow with the demand, which means a shift to the right. Now, I think I just heard somebody say up. Did somebody say up? I'm kind of glad that you said up if you said up. But, um, and the reason is, I just want to show you a little illusion. I'm kind of a Chris Angel fan, and maybe you guys like magic. This is about as good as it gets in econ class. Did the demand curve shift up or did it shift right? <laughs> it looks like it shifted up. It kind of raised up, right? But through the magic of econ and an eraser, now it shifted right. So bottom line is you can think of it kind of shifting up, 
But it's not correct in terms of the actual economic behavior. Because remember how we told the story with income um, on Wednesday? So at a price of $10, I used to want to buy 120 units of this good, and now I want to buy 160, right? The quantity that I want to purchase was different when my income went up. Okay, so it's really a shift to the right is kind of following the logic of the, of the economics. Maybe more importantly is that when we get to supply, I might as well cut to the chase here a little bit. If I shift up the supply curve, it's actually a shift left or a decrease in supply. And so an up here means an increase in demand, and up here means a decrease. But you're always telling the right story if you think left and right. Left is a decrease in supply, and left is a decrease in demand. So down arrow, up arrow always kind of goes with left and right. All right, we'll come back to that here in a little bit. We're going to get into supply shifters later. But that's the reason think left and right instead of up and down. So inferior goods. We've got... Maybe some hot dogs we talked about. We got ramen noodles. We've got Keystone Light beer. Uh, or Milwaukee's Beast. Vienna sausages. We've got Vienna sausages, maybe. Uh, I'm not just familiar in the sausage market, but you might be right. Spam. All right, spam might be another good one. So as income goes up, as we get a little richer, we decide to shift our consumption into maybe some perceived to be higher quality goods. Does that mean we give up ramen noodles altogether? Yes. No. Heck no, I love ramen noodles. I eat those once in a while too. Um, so, but you'll do, on average, instead of eating ramen noodles five days a week, like you do when you're a poor college student, you might cut back to one day a week or something, right? So on average, your income goes up, you tend to consume less ramen noodles, which would be a shift to the left of the demand curve. All right, then we got to the price of related goods. So PRG was the price of related goods. Had two different ones we looked at. Maybe I won't go into quite as great a detail since we did that last time. Substitutes, Pepsi and Coke, or give me another example of some substitutes. Cereal and granola bars. Granola bars and what? Cereal. And cereal, okay. So eat a granola bar or eat some cereal. So there can be different degrees of substitutability between two goods as well. So substitutes and our second case was complements. And again, I'm kind of abbreviating since we did this Wednesday. This is just kind of a little pressure. Um, so an increase in the price of a substitute good, and maybe I'll just more specifically put sub here. An increase in the price of a substitute leads to a increase or decrease in the demand for this good. A increase. 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 Yeah. Price of Pepsi gets higher. I tend to buy more Coke. Coke. Good. And just the opposite here. If the price of a complement goes up, if we're talking um, peanut butter and jelly, the price of peanut butter gets more expensive. I buy not only less peanut butter, but less jelly. Okay? All right, so number three. We did not get to number three last time, correct? Okay. So number three on our shifter list here is going to be the population. The population. Or you can think of this as just the number of consumers. Now, we don't get much of an uptick, but we get some here. It was a lot bigger at Iowa State University where I used to teach um, the college kid effect. But in little old Ottawa here with a town of, uh, let's just call it 13,000, uh, what happens to the demand for pizza and pizza time when college comes back into session here August 26th? It goes up. It goes up, right? Just by more bodies being there, right? <coughs> So that's all by itself 
the number of consumers in a locality is going to increase the demand uh, for um, goods in general there. So an increase in population leads to an increase in demand, a shift to the, uh, to the right. All right. Number four. Expectations. Expectations. So an increase in, I think we were talking about gasoline before, an increase in the expected price of gas, in other words, you're expecting gasoline prices to be higher in the future, how does that impact what you do today. Buy it all now. Buy now, right? So you run to the gas, uh, the gas store, otherwise the fill-up station or whatever we want to call it, the quickie mart, and fill it up. So an increase in the expected price of gas leads to an increase in demand. shift to the right. Now, um, there can be changes to demand from uh, other expectations. So if you expect to make um, more income, so you have a higher expected income, how might that change your behavior today? Would you tend to buy more things or less things? Yeah, so it kind of gets into credit, actually, and your, that's how your uh, text tends to, to handle it, too. So you expect higher income in the future, and so you buy more today. So that leads to an increase in demand. So those are how expectations play a role. Now, uh, one thing I might want to just note on this is that is the opposite of the law of demand. Right? So there's a big difference. A note. P of gas does not equal PE of gas. My notation is awfully close to each other, but we just went through the law of demand. If there's an increase in the actual price, today's price of gas, we buy less of it. But an increase in the future price leads us to buy more. And in fact, this is a movement along the demand curve. If we were looking at just the price of gas, and this one is a shifter. So if I maybe do that one a little more carefully just for the heck of it, because you'll see this in some problems. Here's the demand curve. That demand curve holds the expectation of gas constant. So if we expect gasoline prices to stay at 349, I just filled today, we expect tomorrow's price to be 349, then today, let's say it's 349 at the pump, we are going to pump up 16 gallons of gas. However, if I now learn that, hey, gas prices are on the rise, well, I used to want to buy 16, 16 gallons today at 349, but now that gas prices are expected to be higher, like they're going to ramp up to four dollars. Let's just make it a little obnoxious here. So now today I want to buy 22 gallons of gas, given the fact that we're expecting gas prices to go up now to four dollars a gallon. Okay, so this caused a shift in the curve as opposed to a movement along the curve. If the today's gas prices change and they fall, I buy more gasoline or less gasoline if they rise. We say that this is a movement, so the change in the price of gas leads to a movement along the demand curve. movement along the demand curve if we're just changing the price of gasoline. 
All right, any questions on that? That's a little slippery topic that you're going to struggle with maybe as you go through the homework, go through the test, the differences between shifting curves and movements along. All right, so this is law of demand stuff here. We've got one more shifter to put in. That's kind of an elusive one as well. Number five is a your tastes and preferences. Tastes and preferences for the good. So, um, if you're out of town uh, traveling in uh, New York, let's say, and uh, did you likely bring an umbrella with your luggage? <coughs> Probably not. And the forecast is cats and dogs for the next five days of the seven days you're going to be in New York. Has your taste or preferences for umbrellas changed because of the weather forecast, right? Yeah. And so that might increase your demand for an umbrella, on, on your personal level anyway, because of the increase in rain. All right, so how else do our tastes or preferences for particular goods get shaped in the real world? How are you guys influenced on the lovely products that we buy? What else shapes your particular tastes or preferences for the good? For some, it would be brand. Okay, brand. Good. And how might, uh, sorry, let me get back to your, let me play off of your brand name. So um, if there's an established brand that's out there, that's staying constant over time, right? So at $3.49, I buy this much gas from the Shell Gas Company. Um, how does that change over time, my views of that brand? If there's an oil spill. Okay, good. So there could be some negative press on an oil spill. How else do we change our preferences of the brand? What are some ways that they try to influence it? Um, possibly, uh, if we go with other brands cheaper, then we're back to number two, though. So I want it to be specific to Mountain Dew. How does advertising? Uh, advertising is kind of what I was trying to pull out. So. Um, businesses do a, a pretty good job of educating us on how great their product is or how great Justin Bieber thinks their product is, right? And so if we have a bunch of Bieber fans of the junior high and the high school kids and now that he starts to get older, assuming that his talent persists over time, then we'll have 20-somethings and 30-somethings or whatever if he's the next, you know, Michael Jackson type figure. Then if Bieber grabs a Mountain Dew, well, then I'm going to be grabbing a Mountain Dew, right? Yeah, yeah. So our taste or preferences are shaped by that. So it could be shaped by natural things, maybe by negative events of the oil spill, positive events, advertising, education. All of these things influence our taste or preferences. So I'm just going to give you one example here. Um, if something is cool. I guess we don't use the word cool anymore, probably, right? Uh, give me a, would, would that, does that still work for you guys? Okay. So if something is cool, uh, then there is an increase in demand, right? So holding all the things, go, why did it become cool? Well, other cool kids started doing it, and now everybody's doing it. So whoever the trendsetters were, started doing something. All right, so that's this kind of uh, sets the stage then for all of the things that uh, influence our demand behavior. All right, so have this list memorized is my recommendation to you. I'd really like you to know it, but at a minimum for the, for the upcoming test and, the, and really the rest of the semester, we're going to play off some of these you should have this memorized, meaning you should be able to, on a blank sheet of paper, go income, maybe normal and inferior, but at least go income, price-related goods, population, expectations, and taste of preferences. Those are the things that influence the consumer. 
things that'll shift demand. All right. Supply. We have a law of supply. You were going to start out with the law, you betcha. The law of supply. So, let me get this thing going a little bit. It's a missing, I gotta get that figured out. I really like it when it kind of follows me a little more naturally. The law of supply. As the price of a good <coughs> increases, the quantity supply <coughs> does what? As the price of a good increases, what happens to the quantity supplied by producers? Down? I see some people going down. What do you think? I see some pew, some pew. So quantity, this one's a little bit uh, tricky because some of you are mentally substituting the word price with cost, I think. That would be my prediction after teaching this for 20 years. So as the price that they can sell their good at, the, as the price starts to go up, their ability to sell their product as that price goes up, are they willing to bring more to the marketplace or less? More. more. So that's good, more. So as the price goes up, the price that they can sell their product for tends to rise by forces kind of outside their control. Again, the, the other thing that makes this kind of difficult is that you guys tend to think, and that's part of why we're in this class, that everybody sets their price. Well, they just raise their price if they want to make more money. Well, they're, they're subject to other economic forces that don't allow them to do that. So if it's whatever the market bears, whether they can maybe have some price power that we'll spend a lot of time learning later. But for now, we just want to have price going up, the price that they can sell their product for, maybe because Justin Bieber's doing it, there's an increase in demand for Mountain Dew or whatever, something's allowing them to get a higher price, that causes them to want to bring more to the market. So the quantity supplied increases. Now, we gotta tack on that weird two words that we learned. Ceteris paribus, what did that mean? Always. Holding all other things constant. So that's the only thing we're allowing to do is to have the price, the sale price of their product go up. This then gives us our traditional picture of positive slope. A positive slope, you got it, that upward sloping thing there. So these two variables are positively related to each other. So if the price is, let's go two, four, six, eight, who do we appreciate? As the price goes up, at two dollars, they decided, you know what, I'm gonna bring, I'm gonna put 10 units on the shelf. Units of what, by the way? Arizona. Arizona T, I heard first. So, uh, is it okay if I abbreviate that to T? All right, you can you can insert Arizona, your favorite brand of tea. So, at two dollars, I'm going to buy ten glasses jugs of tea. At and I'm sorry, I'm telling the wrong story already. I was on these guys over here because I was thinking you liking tea, so that was on my brain. So the Arizona people that are producing the tea. If they can get two bucks for their tea, they're gonna put 10 bottles on the shelf. If they know they can get $4 for their tea, they're gonna put more. So they're gonna ramp it up to let's say 15. And if they get $6, they're even more willing to put more product down. They're going to put up, oh, I'm just gonna keep this nice and straight line here, 20. And at $8, they'll ramp it up to 25. 
And then, of course, there's points in between. I just arbitrarily picked 2468 because we were looking to appreciate economics. Yay, go econ. I think that's the first cheer, cheerleading cheer I've ever done in this class, and probably the last one, judging by the response. <laughs> so that gives us the supply curve, the willingness of producers to bring their product to market. OK, so producers like high prices. I think at this point, it's maybe still helpful to think about why they like high prices. And what is the producer out to do? What are they trying to maximize? Profit. Profit. So the profit motive is an important one. So profit is what? How do you calculate profit? So maybe lemonade stand. Sorry, Mallory, go ahead. You're fine. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, everything. Everything you make after you take out your costs. After you take out your costs. Okay, so what's everything you make? How did you calculate that? Um, now okay. go lemonade stand for me. Okay. So my son used to run a lemonade stand uh, outside of our house and pull down at least a $100 bill every weekend that there was an Iowa State football game going on. Oh, nice. We lived about eight houses from the football stadium, and so at age five, he was making over $100 uh, game for the home games, because we'd have probably 10,000 people walking past our house. You put a little, cute little kid with some curls and, and out there, and he's kind of got lemonade. People tend to just buy it. So, uh, so if he sold, <laughs> tell me now on everything you bring in minus your cost, how does it work for him calculating his profit? He has to pay all the people for all his lemons. Uh, he had to pay dad <laughs> some rent, uh, but yeah, that's that's a different story we'll get to later. But how? Do, what's the first part of calculating the profit? I mean, you got the cost, but I'm more about worried about the other part. How did he make money? Your revenue. His revenue. So how much he charged? So he went a buck a glass. And then what? What else information do you need? How many, glasses How many glasses he sold, right? So it's price times quantity. So profit, by the way, I'm going to use a pi notation for profit. So profit is equal to total revenue or price times quantity minus total cost. So for our lemonade stand, if we have a dollar per glass, and we sold um, 110 glasses. We earned revenue of $110. And then what came into his cost? Lemons. Lemons. Probably didn't even go to the lemon level, but. More like country time. <laughs> yeah, well, no, right. country time, big jug, pour it in there, add some water, right? So all of those sorts of costs might go in there. And by the way, yes, I did make him pay for the uh, lemonade, and we'll get into that in detail later. But he had some sort of cost. The difference between what his costs were and what he brought in in the cash register. So I like to think of this as the cash register. That is the total sales revenue that I brought in. Cash register receipts minus my uh, total cost. Whatever those were. And we're going to spend a whole chapter getting into diving into details on that. But I think it's helpful at this point to keep that in mind because now it maybe makes sense to you, right? So as price goes up, they're going to have more on the revenue side and potentially more profit. So a higher price would be associated, in this case, with higher profit. And that's kind of the, an important link. All right, questions or comments on law of supply? All right, law of demand. What are some other things that are important that would affect the quantity supplied if we didn't hold them constant when we drew this curve, right? So we're looking for things that are important for the business that would affect how much quantity to put on the shelves, the quantity supplied. 
So you can think Lemonade, you can think uh, Country Mart, you can think Walmart. What are some things that impact businesses in general that would alter the quantity they're willing to supply to the market? Their customer base. Customer base. Okay, now, that sounds very similar to the population, right? So the customer base would be part of the demand, something that's outside of their control wouldn't necessarily influence. It's going to be a factor as we put the two together, but not something right in their purview of deciding how much to bring to market. Because we're going to cover all prices, is what this does for us, 2, 4, 6, 8. Doesn't matter where they're at, they can make a decision of how much they'd be willing to bring to the market. Resources. Resources. Okay, so our next list here is supply shifters. And the first one we'll put on is not the quantity of resources, but the price of those resources. So the price of resources. And I want you to underline price. The price of resources. This is going to tie directly into the cost ah! equation over here. So one of his resources is the big jug of, of country time lemonade, right? If that goes up, that might influence our ultimate decision. If we are Walmart and we uh, are paying wages and there's a change in minimum wage law, that might affect the level of employment or how much they can supply to the market, right? So one of the prices of resources would be, for example, let's say the wage. You know, maybe we're a big steel factory and uh, the uh, workers are, are uh, thinking about unionizing and so they're facing a wage bump. So example, wage for labor. So that's the price of labor hours. An increase in wages leads to a increase or decrease in supply. Decrease. Decrease. Now, on our graph here then, what the story we're telling is that at $8, I used to want to supply 25 units, but now that my that was when my wages were at let's say $10 an hour, now that I'm facing $15 an hour wages, I'm only going to be able to supply this amount. At $6, I used to be willing to supply 20 units, now I'm only going to supply this amount. At $4, I used to supply 15, and now I'm only going to supply that. And so at every price, in fact, possibly at $2, Maybe this is kind of interesting one to think about. At $2, I used to want to bring 10 units to the market, but now I can't even afford to bring any to the market at two. The minimum price that I'll start bringing product to the market now that I'm facing these higher resource prices is that price has to get up to 276 right there. Right? And so that is the new supply curve. And so the supply curve shifted to the left when there was an increase in the price of resources. So down arrow, decrease in supply. Shift left. Okay. Um, number two. The price of related outputs. Well, this is a little bit different. I could use the word goods, but I don't want to use that because I don't want to confuse that with the demand side. So now it's the price of related outputs. And so imagine you're a, a farmer here in Kansas. Um, what are the types of crops that you might choose to put in in your thousand acres of land? Corn, Corn. Soybeans. soybeans, and wheat. Those might be three good ones just to pick up. So 
Price of related outputs would be that the farmers have choices to do that. So if there's an increase in the price of wheat, if there's an increase in the price of wheat, what happens to the supply of corn? Corn goes up, wouldn't it? go up because we can't provide as much wheat so we have to make up for the difference right so you got a thousand acres of land wheat prices are high what do you choose to put in this year wheat instead of corn causes a decrease not how much it costs for in the supply costs for them see that's getting confusing because right. price so when you're when you're working through these, it, then you want to start to put on different hats, and that's why I really advise that you have these memorized. That's a supply shifter. That's a demand shifter, because when you read a problem, then you'll have to kind of wear a different hat depending on what the problem is, and try not to get confused with your natural consumer tendencies, since you guys have been consumers more so than producers in your life, um, and kind of think through these things. So an increase in the price of wheat. Um, by the way, if this was the wheat market instead of the tea market, an increase in the price of wheat from $4 a bushel to $6 a bushel causes an increase in the quantity supplied. It does not shift the wheat supply curve, right? But if I'm putting wheat in the ground, I can't put corn in the ground, so that would cause a decrease in the supply of corn. So are wheat and corn substitutes in production or complements in production? Substitutes. Substitutes, good. So these are substitutes in production. When we did this with consumers, they were sub we looked at substitutes and complements in consumption. Okay. Now, what about uh, an increase in the price of honey? Leads to what? in the supply of beeswax. I know this gets a little technical. I'm not even very good with this one, but if you know, maybe you've seen some, uh, some bee product or some, uh, not bee production, honey production. How does it work? How do we get honey in the jars of our cupboards? What's the production process? We got those little, you smoke them and you take Yeah, the bees go around. What do the bees do? What do, what do they make? The honeycomb, right? Which is part of beeswax, is where beeswax comes from. So, if there's an increase in the price of honey, what's going to happen to the quantity supplied of honey? Quantity supplied now of honey. So, if I was to draw a little uh, quantity of honey, price of honey, supply of honey. Go up. If there's an increase in the price from $6 to $8, is that going to shift the supply of honey? No. No, it's going to be a movement along the honey supply curve. But that's going to cause what for beeswax? Supply. It would go up, right, as a byproduct of this behavior. Making more honey. So we're making we're more honey. More Since they're complements in the production process, they go hand in hand. One's a byproduct of the other. Then you're going to get an increase in the supply of beeswax because these two things are complements in production. So on the, if you're drawing these little graphs, this one might be helpful to just kind of reinforce what was going on. If this is the beeswax situation, this is the price of beeswax, by the way, it has a market itself. You can buy beeswax um, separately. I think you can make candles out of it. You can do some other, other stuff in plastic and, okay. So that has its own supply curve. That supply curve was predicated on the price of honey being at $6. Right? So at a $6 price of honey and a $2 price of beeswax, producers were producing a 100 units of beeswax. 
But once the price of honey shot up, they used to supply 100 units of beeswax at $2, but now they're supplying more, right? So the beeswax supply curve when honey prices were $8 is located to the right of where we were, which is exactly what we explained here, but with the up arrows and down arrows. Okay, chugging right along. Uh, let's see, what should we do next? Let's do the number of suppliers. So number, I think I can squeeze this in. Okay, so two, three, one, this one's kind of easy. Number three, the number of suppliers. You might just think of this as the number of firms. So firms, businesses, the number of businesses, the number of firms in a particular industry is what we're really focusing on here because we might be looking at the honey industry, for instance. And if there's an increase in the number of honey producers holding all of the things constant, what happens to the supply of honey? Does it increase or decrease? goes up, right? Just more bodies. If there's another pizza shop that opens up in Ottawa, there's an increase in the supply of pizza, right? So that one kind of flows naturally. An increase in the number of firms, an increase in the number of suppliers leads to an increase in supply. Shift to the right. So with expectations, it's kind of um, situational. Um, you know, one of the things that's uh, been kind of key in our economy lately, the last um, since the since the crisis of 2008 and the falling free fall for a while, and then slow recovery, is what's going to happen to the general economy? So if I'm running a Mountain Dew business, I was just talking last night with a an executive up at the cargo tech plant and he was talking about the fall the, that um, place makes these unique uh, machines maybe you've seen them up on the north side of town they're kind of weird looking trucks that haul large uh, containers shipping containers that they do shipping with and they have uh, they're based out of Finland and they they're it's a global company and operates their American plant is out of little old Ottawa here and uh, he was explaining that the global slowdown in Europe and in China has influenced their business quite a bit. So expectations about maybe the general economy might play a role in uh, our behavior as a company, whether we're selling pizza on Main Street or these large cargo, uh, uh, cargo machines. Uh, expectations. So um, let's see. A, uh, a rosy outlook, an increase in uh, expectations about, an increase might not be the best uh, way to look at that, about the economy, so economic growth, a shift outward of the production possibilities frontier. would tend to lead to an increase or decrease in the supply of the good. Increase, right? So we expect that people are going to be out there buying or whatever. Well, that would lead to an increase in supply, a shift to the right with a uh, positive expectation. Um, No, 
Number five, technology. So an increase in technology, would that lead to a general increase or decrease in supply? Increase. increase. Now, there might be some weird stories we could tell about technology influencing other factors, but if we're within a certain industry, the honey industry again, if we're looking at honey supply, and there's a change in technology of honey making, there's a new machine that comes out that processes it faster or harvests the bees better or whatever it is, um, that'll tend to uh, increase the productivity. The amount of honey that we can process per dollar goes up, and so that leads us to being able to supply more honey at each one of those old prices. All right, so... Um, there's one more wild card one that sometimes I leave off and sometimes I put in. Um, but let's put it in today. And that is the weather. So weather can, could be characterized in some of these other parts. That's why sometimes I leave it on, sometimes I leave it off. But if we're talking about Florida and there's an early frost, in the orange market, what happens to the supply of oranges? It goes down, right? So it's just killing it off. And so we could go other natural disasters, but so early frost in Florida leads to a decrease in the supply of oranges. All right, we will call it a day there. Uh, yeah, potentially.